Hello, hello. My name is Regine Jackson. I'm the Dean of Humanities, Social Sciences, Media, and Arts here at Morehouse. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event tonight. And to welcome some of you, some of our guests we have who have never been to Morehouse before. So I want to give you a warm welcome to Morehouse College. Even on this rainy, cold-ish Friday night, I'm happy to see so many of you here. This is an event that I've been looking forward to um, almost as much as I was looking forward to seeing the election results on Tuesday. But when Professor Ron Thomas approached me and told me about the history of this event, I, I hopped on board to collaborate um, with him on it. This dates back ever since Barack Obama's election in 2008, the Department of Journalism and Sports, Culture and Social Justice has been hosting a post-election review following all of the presidential uh, elections since then and important midterm elections. And 2022 uh, definitely qualifies as an important election not only for us here in the state of Georgia, but for the country. So I want to say a little bit about the Department of Journalism and Sports, Culture, and Social Justice. I was so impressed um, to see that we had such a unique program here at Morehouse and um, to hear about, to learn about its roots founded uh, in collaboration with uh, one of our alums, Spike Lee, um, in 2007, 2008. And it, it really does the work of bringing together different perspectives and helping students tell compelling stories um, in clear and um, meaningful ways. And Professor Ron Thomas, who is the chair of Journalism in Sports, Culture, and Social Justice, has been here from the very beginning. He joined the faculty at Morehouse in 2007, and he had the vision for this program but also he had the, um, the, he continued to innovate it and grow it into an independent department which uh, with a number of rich course offerings and internship offerings um, in the division. It really is a crowning jewel of the humanities, social sciences, media, and arts department. Ron is the author of They Cleared the Lane, and I, I say this in all seriousness, the only book about sports that I have ever purchased. <laughs> he was one of the first people who welcomed me to the house, and it's my pleasure to introduce him tonight, Ron Thomas. Dean Jackson, th thank you very much for that, for that wonderful introduction. And um, thank you all for, for coming here on a Friday night on a college campus to come to listen to a panel discussion. So I really appreciate your, uh, your coming today. And we certainly think that the, uh, the topic, um, the, the, the midterm elections and how they're going to affect uh, the future of America is, is certainly worthwhile, all of our attendance and, and our attention. because. Um, you know, I was telling some of my students that, you know, I, I don't know how many, maybe I'll be here 20, 30 more years, you know, but you're going to be here 60 years probably. So um, a lot of your life is going to be determined by what happens in politics uh, to the, uh, this year. So I, um, I want to thank um, the support I've received in getting the, in putting together this program. Um, you know, I want to thank the Office of Student Life which I know did a very good job of informing a lot of the students uh, about the program. And also I want to thank um, Dr. Rice for allowing it to be a crown form after dark. I know it's really beneficial to a lot of you and uh, will help you graduate and it's beneficial uh, for us to have so many of you here. So, um, so those are two strong contrib contributors to, um, to our effort today. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit about the journalism program. It, um, it started in 2007. And it was the dream of, of Spike Lee, who you all know, and also Ralph Wiley, who um, was a, a friend of mine when we both were sports writers on the West Coast. Uh, we both 
covered sports in the Bay Area for quite a long time. And then I came here. He moved on to Sports Illustrated, wrote several books, and um, also used to write for Spike. And he would tell Spike about the few numbers of um, black sports writers uh, that, you know, in the press box. A lot of times he and I both were the only black sports reporter or one of maybe two. And um, so that inspired them to come up with the idea of developing our own black sports reporters by starting a sports journalism program um, at a HBCU. And um, Ralph, Ralph had gone to Knoxville College, Spike had gone to Morehouse, and they decided to bring the idea here. So at Morehouse, we did, and the administration decided, uh, based on a survey from students, that they should expand the program and make it a general journalism program, but with a sports emphasis. That did make it unique, particularly um, unique from HBCUs when we started. So um, we've grown from a minor, I mean, from, from a concentration to a minor, and then last year it became a major. And the, uh, the name of the major really uh, um, expresses the breadth of our program. So our major is named Journalism in Sports, Culture, which really stands for Arts and Culture, and Social Justice. So if you have a great interest in any of those, we certainly have um, particular courses that will relate to your interest. But the other thing I'd like um, all of you to think about, even if you don't, can't conceive of yourself at all as being a journalist, the one thing I can guarantee you is no matter what you do professionally, you will need to write well. Um, if you're going to be a pastor, you've got to write your sermons every Saturday night. If you're going to be a chemist, you're going to be writing uh, lab reports. You know, if you're going to be a historian, obviously writing and research is a big part of what you're going to be doing. And I'm sure if you're going to be a computer scientist and you have to, your supervisor sends you to a conference and asks you for a one-page summary, um, learning how to write journalistically will help you be able to fit all that information into one page. Because one thing about journalism is um, articles are easy to read, and that's because we really learn how to write concisely and, um, and pack a lot of information into a small space. So if you can take that skill anywhere, and you can learn that in our program. I, I um, hope that all of you have picked up a, uh, a list of our course descriptions. And um, if you're interested in, in journalism, there are a few courses that don't have prerequisites, but the, um, this intro to multimedia journalism, which I teach, is the introductory course. And you start there, and then you can take any of the, uh, of the advanced courses after that. And if you decide to major in journalism, um, you can major in any of the tracks, either sports track, the arts and culture, or in the social justice track. Um, and so um, I also wanted to, to mention that we have a, a bonus here today. We know that many of you could, would be at the premiere for, for Black Panther, Wakanda, forever. And so um, to sort of compensate for your being here, um, I've got 15 tickets for, the, um, for that movie. And so you all, while you're here, should get a ticket stub. The man in the white shirt there, my assistant, Greg Brown, is pulling up the ticket stubs now. And he'll be passing them out, so everyone gets one ticket stub. And at the end, we're going to have them all in a fishbowl or something, and we're going to pull out the numbers um, for, for those who won the tickets. So, um, so I want to, um, to next introduce um, our, our um, narrator, moderator, and that is Jaron Gaynor. And it's a thrill for me to introduce him, because uh, Jaron graduated in 2011. So about 11 years ago, he was in your seat. And now Jaron has gone from there to uh, Columbia Graduate School. And we've got about 17, I think, students who have gotten a master's in journalism from Columbia. And Jaron is one of them. And, um, and then he progressed to work in several different media outlets and has been at the GRIO now for about six years. He's their manager, editor of politics. And uh, most recently, uh, Jaron is one of their White House uh, White House correspondence. So he has progressed greatly in, in this business, and, and I'm extremely prou uh, proud of him. So I want to just um, mention some specific things uh, from his bio. And you know you sort of made it when you've got a bio already ready to go. <laughs> so, so the fact that he didn't have to type it, but he could just send it to me right away, it tells me how, how far he's gone. So 
Jaron leads the GRIO's political team alongside senior White House correspondent and DC Bureau Chief April Ryan, covering the White House, Capitol Hill, and national politics. Notably, his work in Washington helped lead to the GRIO becoming the first black-owned digital news outlet to get a designated seat in the White House press briefing room and the only black-owned digital newsroom in the presidential pool. Jaron has appeared on Cheddar TV, Revolt Black News, and Fox Soul's The Tammy Mack Show. During Pride Month 2000, 2021, Forbes recognized Jaron as one of, quote, 10 black LGBTQ plus figures and activists to know. He's a native of Brooklyn, New York, and Gaynor is a, is a proud graduate of Morehouse College class of 2011, and as I mentioned before, a graduate of Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. So, Jaron, you carry us the rest of the way. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, as Mr. Thomas mentioned, uh, I once sat in this very auditorium for this very panel. I was here for the very first panel. Um, I was a sophomore when President Obama was first elected. And I remember you know, his election really piquing my interest about politics. And it really activated my political awareness. And never in a million years did I think that I would uh, be a part of the White House press corps asking the President of the United States of America and his administration tough questions um, for black America. I think it's worth noting that the GRIO is a black news site, a black owned news site. Um, and so I'm happy to be here. It's really full circle for me to be back home. Um, Morehouse College is where Morehouse raised me. Um, and Mr. Thomas and the journalism program, although I was not a journalism major, because at the time it was not a major, I was an English major, but I did take classes. I was an editor for the Maroon Tiger. And um, I'm just happy to be here and f facilitate this conversation. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that we did have an election just a few days ago. I hope everyone in here, everyone in here voted. Um, this is an interesting time in our country because um, in, on January 6, 2021, uh, we were not sure that we would have an election, a fair election. And we have so much to unpack about what happened that day, why it happened. And so we have a phenomenal panel of experts and scholars to help guide us through this conversation about why this election matter, uh, matters and votes are still being counted, so it's not quite over. Um, but first, I want to introduce our panelists. First up is uh, Professor Carol Anderson. Uh, she is a professor of African American studies uh, at Emory University, she is the author of several best-selling books, including the second, Race and Guns in a F Fatally Unequal America, One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy, and the critically acclaimed number one bestseller, White Rage, which came out in 2016. Uh, please get these books, they're phenomenal. Uh, in 2019, uh, Professor Anderson contributed an essay to the New York Times Magazine's 1619 Project, an award-winning reframing of American history that placed slavery and its continuing legacy at the center of our national narrative, which is now available as a book. Professor Anderson, welcome. <laughs> our next guest is Greg Bluestein. Greg is a political reporter and author who covers the governor's office and Georgia politics for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, uh, one of the first newspapers I read as a student here at Morehouse. Uh, he writes for the front page of the AJC, contributes to the Political Insider blog and Morning Jolt newsletter, hosts the Politi Politically Georgia podcast, and is a frequent guest on local and national TV and radio programs. He's an MSNBC and NBC News contributor and the author of Flipped, a book on Georgia's epic 2020 election. He's a proud graduate of the University of Georgia with degrees in journalism and political science and lives with his wife and two daughters in Dunwoody. Welcome, Greg. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Samuel Livingston, 
who is an associate professor of African, uh, African studies at Morehouse College. Many of you probably already know him pretty well. Having earned his doc doctoral degree from Temple University in African American studies, his current research extends his concern for black resistance movements and their organic African origins. With over 24 years of academic experience, he teaches a range of courses. He is also engaged in the design and research of the Global Africana Ethical Text Digital Mapping Project, which traces African social, social justice thinking from its ancient African roots to the Black Lives Matter movement. Welcome, Dr. Livingston. So I'm gonna move over here. So welcome, panelists. Um, I want to first start this panel with giving you each three to four minutes to kind of give your top line um, overview uh, uh, of the election. Uh, what stood out to you um, in any kind of way? So we'll first start with Professor Anderson. Thank you so much, Jaron. Um, what stood out for me was a couple of things. One, it was the way that your generation stood up and really came out to vote in mass. It was your wave that stopped that so-called red tide from coming in and engulfing American democracy and destroying our chances for ever, ever having a shot at, at equality and equity. Um, what also stood out for me was, you know, you talked about January 6th. If we understand January 6th as an assault on black voters, because when you had Newt Gingrich saying they stole the election in Atlanta, they stole the election in Philadelphia, they stole the election in Milwaukee, they stole the election in Detroit. What he's saying is that those cities that have sizable black populations stole the election from a white supremacist. And so if we can wipe out though that, that tally, then Donald Trump can be reinstalled in the presidency. That assault on American democracy on January 6th was an assault on black voters. It was saying that your vote doesn't count. It was saying that you are not American citizens and that you are not legitimate. And so this election really was a reassertion of yes, yes, this is our house. Yes, this is our democracy. And yes, we will stand in line, we will send in the ballots, we will go to the drop boxes, but we will vote and we will be heard. And, and that's what I saw in this election. Thank you, I had to follow that. Uh, first, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I've covered Georgia politics for 20 years now, which is insane to think about. Uh, since I was a sophomore at University of Georgia covering a little known Republican named Brian Kemp running for state senate, against a Democrat named Doug Haynes who was supposed to win. That was part of another wave, uh, of, uh, back then it was a red wave, um, of, uh, of Republicans who took control of the governor's office and the state senate and then later on the state house. I covered Stacey Abrams since she was a figure in the state capitol who no one could have picked out in a crowd. Um, but we always knew she was the smartest person in the room. Uh, and she would affect legislation um, in, even, in a, even as a minority in the, in, the state law, in the state legislature, even as a Democrat. Um, because even Republicans knew to listen when she spoke. I've covered Senator Warnock since, you know, since he was a young pastor and he was getting arrested at the state capitol fighting for Medicaid expansion. And I've covered John Ossoff since he called me and I'd never heard of the guy's name in my life and he called me and said, hey Bluestein, I'm running for US House and I have John Lewis's endorsement. And I said, okay, here's someone to listen to. Uh, so it's been a real honor and privilege covering um, all, this, uh, all this election drama um, and also very tiring. A lot of people always say, after elections, you're gonna go on vacation. But that's when, as a reporter, your job really amps up, even without a runoff, but especially now with a runoff. And so when people ask me already, what does this election mean? I say, it means a lot, but we're still not sure of the exact answer because we still have a runoff in just a few weeks, in just December 6th, in less than four weeks now, that could, control, could decide the fate of the US Senate, could decide control of the Senate. But even if not, it will still be instrumental, hugely consequential, between Herschel Walker and Senator Raphael Warnock, and it really does, uh, will shape if Georgia is a purple state, if it's a, as uh, Congresswoman Nakima Williams said, 
a little light, light, uh, darker shade of pink right now, or if it's truly a swing state that will be just as important as we think it will be going into 2024. So I can't wait to talk and, uh, and hear some of your questions later on. Follow both of those um, astute colleagues. Um, uh, what's, I'm going to frame it in this way, because the way that the program was uh, suggested to us is, did democracy win? And to me, being a professor, of course, I'm like, oh, I'm going to give them a grade. <laughs> and mm, I'm looking at a D minus or an F plus for two main reasons. First is the process. When you have a political party that actually is able to set the rules of engagement, to set the terms of the election, to shape the districts, to essentially cultivate who the electorate will be and who, will, who they will not be, you know, um, and, of, and of course, you know, our Governor Brian Kemp, we have to remember in 2018, this man had to be a forced, he had to be sued to, to leave the office of Secretary of State, which oversees elections, while he's running for the office of governor. So it's like, mm, that's interesting. That's interesting. So to me, Georgia is still a part of that um, American conservative um, uh, uh, political movement that has taken the state houses of the majority of, um, of, a, of most American state houses. So that's a fail. You can't have that. The second part is Georgia's racial and gendered mountain. And I'm borrowing a phrase from Langston Hughes, um, you know, the, the Negro rider in the, in the uh, racial mountain. But it's not just a racial mountain, it's a gendered mountain. Um, the only person who I really did any kind of campaign work for, and this was very late in the game, was for Stacey Abrams. And it was just a matter of going out, canvassing, and putting, you know, taking signs around. Um, and, you know, so I was somewhat invested. So, disclaimer, right? And I'll try to be very brief with that. I'm sorry, I think I'm, I'm going on a little bit too long. Um, but I just want to say that I put, and I challenge my students to think about Stacey Abrams' campaign. And the fact that she lost, let's not look at it as a loss. Let's look, look at it as a learning opportunity and what we can do next time that's, that's a little bit more attuned to grassroots electorate. But what I would just say, what stood out, is that this election and the loss of Stacey Abrams fits the pattern of America being in the bottom, bottom of the top third of countries that actually have women elected to office. Countries that are ahead of the United States Algeria, Angola, Egypt, Mali, uh, Afghanistan. This is from the United Nations um, report on women's involvement in, 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 in uh, politics. So when we say that Stacey Abrams lost, well, she was facing an, a, an incredible racial and gender mountain. And I'll, we can go into more after that uh, later on. OK, that's interesting, because I was going to ask each of you a, a question, a, a separate question. Uh, but Dr. Livingston brings up an interesting point about the loss of Stacey Abrams. And so my first question um, is for Professor Anderson. Uh, we saw a record number of black candidates running for statewide offices, whether it was the Senate or governor, uh, Stacey Abrams being the more high profile one. But there was also Sherry Beasley, who ran for Senate in North Carolina, Val Demings, who ran uh, for Senate in Florida, Mandela Barnes, who ran for Senate in Wisconsin. Um, all of these candidates lost. Um, uh, I, Wes Moore, who became governor of Maryland, was the one bright light out of these black candidates. What do you attribute to uh, these black candidates not being successful in this election? And is there a concern that because of these losses, black candidates will not be seen as viable candidates for statewide offices in the future? Well, I think we also need to add Summer Lee, who um, won in, uh, in Pennsylvania a congressional seat. Um, that was amazing. What black candidates consistently face is that racial mountain. Um, it is that high wire that they have to cross without a net of, of being able to be black enough but appeal to a white audience that has learned to be afraid of black folk, particularly black folk with power. Um, so let's take somebody like a Barack Obama, um, who gets cast as this demon 
And when you think about Obama as being scary, <laughs> uh, it gives you a sense of how the, the narrative of, of black fear um, is so powerful. I mean, it's the thing that gave us the Willie Horton ad um, during the George Bush campaign. Um, it is the thing where we kept hearing crime, 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 but they didn't mean Donald Trump. They meant in the cities. And so it is, these are those dog whistles. And so black candidates have to overcome the fear of blackness. And so you saw with Ron Johnson in Wisconsin, he was doing the, you know, Mandela's not like us. He's different. And, and then just using those kind of racial subtext on there that just hit that fear. And that is consistent. And so you see black candidates, you know, so when Val Demings um, debated Marco Rubio and she handed Marco his tail. I mean, she debated him something fierce. But what you heard was, whoo, look at that angry black woman. Those stereotypes are really powerful and they resonate in a broader white psyche about the fear of black folks with power. Um, and so that's what, what I think is one of the major mountains that these candidates have to overcome. And Greg, you know, you are the expert here in Georgia politics. Um, we, as, you meant, as was mentioned earlier at the top of the panel, there's a, there's a runoff happening on December 6th. Georgia, uh, as you mentioned, is a purple state now. And for so long, Florida has been seen as that state that's purple, where Democrats have been, they put a lot of money into Florida, but now Georgia is becoming the, that new purple state in the South. Uh, given the loss of Abrams and we're not going into a runoff, my question to you is, why is it that you think that Warnock fared better than Abrams? And on the topic of Georgia being a purple state, uh, to what do, can you speak to the degree in which black and brown voters are the reason why? Yeah. And to answer the question, you have to go back into Stacey Abrams' history, in the history of Democratic Party, the recent history of Democratic candidates, because for a long time, Democrats in Georgia running statewide campaigns ran as Republican lights. They ran um, Jason Carter, you know, and this, by the way, was conventional wisdom. This wasn't, he wasn't going, um, you know, far and beyond the, the party strategy. But in 2014, when Barack Obama came to Georgia, Jason Carter was anywhere but near Barack Obama. And the same with Michelle Nunn, the candidate for U.S. Senate. Um, he voted for a gun expansion bill. He called himself an NRA Democrat. And again, this wasn't beyond the norm. This was the way that Democrats thought they could win in Georgia, which was embracing certain issues that were, po that were popular with conservatives and moderates, maybe even. Um, but also, you know, his focus was on expanding the Hope Scholarship um, and, and expanding Medicaid and not necessarily uh, the liberal issues that Stacey Abrams showed could be winning issues. So when Stacey Abrams ran four years later, she ran what we call a base plus strategy. She said it shouldn't be uh, just about energizing the base and leaving the moderates behind or going for the moderates and, and leaving the base behind. We can try to do both. And she showed, she came this close to doing both, right? 55,000 or so votes. It was the closest gubernatorial election in, in modern Georgia history. And then in 2020, that base plus strategy of mobilizing uh, regular voters, people who don't usually get excited about uh, voting, uh, plus getting that middle of the electorate. That worked um, and narrowly won for both Senators Ossoff and Warnock and also, of course, President Joe Biden, who won the state for the first time since 1992. But in this electorate, I think Brian Kemp, Brian Kemp's, the, the David Perdue's challenge of Brian Kemp was the best thing that happened in Brian Kemp. Because what it showed to that middle, those swing voters, those independents, people who live in my neck of the woods up in Dunwoody, um, who, who, who were turned off by Donald Trump, but probably leaning conservative and worried about voting for Democrats because they might have bought into the whole, this is gonna change the status quo, all, all that. Um, what Brian Kemp going against David Perdue showed was that, Brian Kemp is no moderate. He'll, he's the last person to tell you he's a moderate. He's very conservative. But David Perdue went far to the right on not just Trump issues, and he did that. He said he would, wouldn't have certified the, the election of Donald Trump. He said he would have supported the Buckhead Cityhood movement, which is a whole different story. He said he wouldn't have 
um, allowed uh, state incentives to be used to get Rivian and Hyundai, the two biggest economic development projects in state history. And by the way, he's a former Fortune 500 CEO whose companies took all sorts of incentives. So he went so far right on so many issues that it made Brian Kemp look moderate in comparison and helped him emerge from that primary. He won it by 52 points against a former US senator. This wasn't some nobody. Um, and so that made him more appealing to that middle of the electorate. And from that point on, in that contest, I mean, the first AJC poll that came out, I think it was in June, showed him with 95% of Republican support. So he didn't have to worry about the base. The rest of the election, he could go and try to appeal to those swing voters in the middle. And that's, I think, the, the difference there is that um, he was this proven quantity in this. He had a first term record to run on. Not everyone loved it, um, but, but his supporters did. And he could go kind of pummel Stacey Abrams with that. Uh, he never really made any second term agenda promises. There's very few, $2 billion refunds. They're big ones, but they're not these sweeping things he had to do in his first term uh, where he promised guns and immigration crackdowns and, 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 and the toughest abortion restrictions in, in the nation and all these, these issues. Instead, he could just point at Stacey Abrams who was making all sorts of promises as well and saying, hey, that would just res result in rising taxes and, 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 and threaten the status quo. And when I talk to uh, Democratic leaders, about why she lost, and there's a lot of reasons, and there's a lot of theories, um, but one of them is that uh, she, she had to resort to a lot of those promises. She had hundreds, you know, more than 100 promises, dozens. She's a policy wonk. She, you can ask her about affordable housing and she'll go on longer than I just went on uh, about her history. I mean, easily, she could speak for an hour on it um, without, without pausing. So, but there's, there is that argument that because she, she had so many different proposals, so much, so much such, such different messaging, and Brian Kemp could just say, Biden, Abrams economy, the, I'm trying to help you fight, I'm trying to help blunt the impact of the Biden, Abrams inflation, and, and to a big segment of the population, 53 or so percent of the work, of, of the vote, that worked. And Dr. Livingston, you know, we are, we're at Morehouse College, this is a, a campus of young people, young black men primarily. Um, you know, young people showed up in big numbers in this election. And they also elected the first member of Generation Z to go to Congress, Maxwell Frost, who I had the opportunity to interview. 25 years old, very impressed by, by him in Florida. Why is it important for young people to be politically engaged, especially in this moment, particularly black men, young black men who are primarily in this room? It seems like a easy question, but it's, it's really loaded. And it's one that I think um, that we have to kind of think about the type of education that is needed um, here at Morehouse, whether we're taking advantage of that, whether it's tied into humanities. First of all, just um, show of hands, how many people are registered to vote in here? Okay, okay. Let's see a few hands that are not. Almost everyone. Almost everyone, almost everyone. Uh, unfortunately, it's too late for this this uh, uh, runoff for, for the Senate seat, but I think it just touches on the significance of being engaged and really an education is not complete unless you are engaged in your community, unless you are actually, unless you are actually taking on and thinking about problems. So one of the things that we did back in 2017 is we restructured our general education program. Um, when you guys take your FYE courses, um, you, you're supposed to uh, have a service learning project that you're engaged in, that you're working on. Because we didn't want, and I had to give credit to my brother Fred um, Knight, uh, who led that effort and everything. Um, so so I, what I'm basically I would say is that it's really important to be engaged because you're not educated unless you are engaged. It's one thing to read about these stories, but it's another to actually be able to see the connections. Um, Y'all have, in your history classes or in your FYE classes, how many people have heard of the Hamburg Massacre? No? One person? How many people have heard of the Colfax County Massacre? How many people have heard of the Wilmington Massacre? You know, the sad thing is, as we could go on and on, the Atlanta Race Massacre. All of these took place in the context of political campaigns. And they all involve these allegations um, of 
It was a rigged election. The election was stolen from you, which was used as a ruse to assault the black community, to assault the, the <laughs> um, uh, so, so basically, and I, I know I, I tend to go on, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be short, but what I'm saying is that the issues um, have, they, in some ways they're, they're different. You know, the, the prominence of the LGBTQIA QIA plus movement is um, definitely something that we have to, uh, have to pay attention to. It's made people much more attentive to like our, our um, personal gender politics, personal sexual politics. Also, the presence of more immigrant communities in, the, in, a, in Georgia, in the United States, we have to pay attention. One of the things that to me was sad, and I think we were talking about this earlier, and I'll put a bow on this, try to. Um, while we are looking at these circus politics, and when we think about um, Herschel Walker and all the drama that's going on with him, uh, when we look at the personal politics, we are taking our eye off of how U.S. policy affects the struggle for democracy around the world, especially in Haiti and the and, uh, uh, Republic of, excuse me, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, hence, our Congo curriculum. Any Congo curriculum students? No, no. Okay, all right, whatever. Uh, oh, where did I, did I see one? I thought I saw one back here. Um, but just to put a bow on it, you're not educated unless you're really engaged, unless you're thinking about solving some of these problems. And if you are here at Morehouse, that is job number one. You have to be thinking about these problems. And so this election was like a, a lab in, in thinking about how do you have a more democratic society. Can I hop in here for a quickie? Sure. Okay, so when you think, it was what you said about the ways that these elections are structured. And so let's take Florida, okay. So in Florida, and I'm, I'm a historian, so I'm gonna take us back a minute. In 1867, there was the Reconstruction Act that said that black men can vote. In 1868, Florida passed a law that was permanent felony disfranchisement. So, and then they crafted the laws to criminalize blackness. So these were laws that were only applied to black men because at the time only black men could vote. By the time we got to 2018, that law was still on the books. And of the 6.1 million Americans who could not vote, 1.7 million of them were in Florida. And Florida with permanent felony disfranchisement, 40% of black men in Florida could not vote because of a felony conviction. Over 20% of all black adults in Florida could not vote because of a felony conviction. So grassroots organizing and mobilization led to Amendment 4. Amendment 4 was to re-engage that felony, that the returning citizens. And it was passed by 65% of the electorate. Whoo! Well, the, 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 the George, the, Florida legislature looked up and they were like Fred Sanford, clutching their hearts going, Lizbeth, I can't believe this. And so they said, okay, so we are gonna have to clarify the language in this amendment. So what does completion of sentence mean? And so they said, well, it's not just that you completed your term in prison and you completed your parole or your probation. It means you have also paid all of your fines, fees, and court costs. So this thing goes up to the courts, and the court rules that that is not a poll tax. But the court goes even worse than that, that Florida doesn't have to tell them how much they owe. So you think about how you're, you're being blocked, just like the literacy test questions back in the days of Jim Crow, when Mississippi could ask you how many bubbles in a bar of soap. And that was your access point to the ballot box. Or my, the, the man who helped raise me came from Georgia. His literacy test question was, how high is up? And so when Florida tells you, okay, so you have to pay all of your fines, fees, and court costs to be able to vote, but we don't have to tell you how much you owe. It's like, dang. 
And so now you think about how then Ron DeSantis sets up an election integrity police force that then starts arresting black folk who got their, their voter, voter uh, um, certification cards but said, no, now that the county has said that you can vote and then you cast your ballot, but because you had that felony conviction and didn't meet all I dot and T cross, they're now arresting those folks. And it was to send the signal to that black and car uh, previously incarcerated community that you vote, you're going back to jail. Five years and $5,000. Now, you, so you wanna talk about the ways that that election went down when you can terrorize so many members of the black community to keep them from the polls by threatening them with criminalization and imprisonment. And then you had Ron DeSantis overriding the, the maps that were drawn, the congressional maps that were drawn, and redrawing them in ways that would fit to create more staunch Republican districts. And so when we're talking about the balance of, of the House of Representatives in Congress, we have to look at that mess down in Florida. Um, and so this is why we, we must engage. We must know what's going on. And so we must know why it looks the way it looks so we know what we're going after. Something really quick. I know it seems daunting to get engaged. Um, I'll say that Stacey Abrams, one of her top advisors, I spoke at to her class at UGA just two years ago. I mean, there are students who get engaged, the Capitol's right down the street. That we, we are the home of the, one of the best and most important battleground states in the nation. And it doesn't have to be the Senate race. It doesn't have to be the big flashy race. You could find a candidate or a cause um, literally right down the street. They, there, there are candidates, both parties, whoever, who are begging for young students to get involved in their campaigns and in their, not just their campaigns, their legislative duties. And it's just a short drive away. And I see students at the Capitol all the time. It warms my heart. It's great. They, they, there needs to be a lot more engagement. And so don't let the whole, the, the daunting aspect of getting involved in a, because uh, it is, right? There's, there's a lot going on. There's, right now, there's 6,000 TV cameras at every single Warnock or Walker stop. I'm trying to encourage the professor to, to come to one of the stops with me just so she can see for herself. Uh, the, the she wants me to go to Herschel Walker. <laughs> As a scholar, just to see. Let's be clear. <laughs> As a scholar, just to see, because it is, it is, uh, it's, 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 it's unique to see uh, all this playing out in your own backyard. Um, but anyway, but, but it is as daunting as it is to get involved in the Senate race, which is very important too. There are so many ways you can get involved on the grassroots level for candidates and campaigns and issues that desperately need your help. Uh, this question is for all three. Um, we have a little time, but let's try to be as succinct as possible. I want to talk about what's at stake, because even though we're still counting ballots and we don't yet know who will control the House and the Senate, this will have implications on how President Biden is able to govern and legislate. Uh, this administration, regardless of how you feel, has been very active. Um, they've passed a lot of bills. If Congress is divided, how will that impact President Biden's ability to do more? Will we see inaction, or do you think that Republicans and Democrats can work in a bipartisan way like we saw with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act? I'll start with Professor Anderson. She looks like she's ready to answer. Um, I think this is why this election is so important. So one, if the Democrats are able to control the Senate, it means that uh, judicial appointments will continue to be able to come through. If the Democrats do not, and what that means is, is that we've got some folks who are knock knocking on 70's door on the, in the US Supreme Court. <sighs> yeah, if, if the Democrats control the Senate, Biden will be able to get his nominee through. If he doesn't, we're going to see the same mess we saw under Obama with Merrick Garland, and, and, and it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Um, when it comes to the House, the House has sworn, the Republicans have sworn if they take control of the House to begin a series of investigations into Hunter Biden's laptop and into, to impeach 
and to impeach Biden, but they don't know what for. So, I mean, it just, it, so it, it, is, it is clown car governance, and they have threatened to, to yeah, <laughs> clown car governance, and they have threatened to basically hold the debt ceiling hostage unless they can gut and basically shut down the government, destroy the U.S.'s credit rating, and, and we know how important credit ratings are. Uh, so to destroy the U.S.'s credit rating unless they can make massive cuts into to Social Security and Medicare. And you know they're coming after Medicaid too. I mean, so all of the safety net programs that are there, that's what they're going to hold the U.S.'s credit rating hostage for. So, so much is at stake in this election and, and trickle down effects um, of, divided, of divided government. Um, because you know, we had to some extent, well, you had a Republican Supreme Court. Let's just say it like that, a conservative Supreme Court. You had both houses um, of Congress controlled by Democrats. They were able to pass some significant legislation. But what we really need to look at too is the movement that I can't even call conservatism. We cannot call it really conservatism or, you know, I call it, I, I've taken to call it neo-Confederate ideology. Neo-Confederate ideology. And what I think we'll see with Brian Kemp, Brian Kemp is a master politician, masterful politician. Um, I, in, in, to some extent, it was David Perdue, but, um, but I really think Trump was the greatest gift that he received. Mm -hmm. I say neo-conservative, pol neo-Confederate politics, because you look at a, political figure like Benjamin Pitchfork Tillman. 1908, 1906, Bluestein is probably like, dude, you really going back there? No. Yes, I'm going back there. Hey, no problem. But listen to Tillman's rhetoric in particular around a series of lectures he gave called The Negro Problem and Immigration. And in these um, lectures, I know I got, I, I made a PowerPoint for this whole thing. I'm sorry, like y'all do. That's sad, dude. Really, you gotta make a PowerPoint for a conversation. Um, but in, in, these speech, in these series of speeches, he basically challenged his white audience. And he says, you have to look at the fact that black people are ahead of you in population, and unless something comes along, and he names diseases, syphilis, tuberculosis, alcoholism, or something else shall come along and desolate these people, then we are bound to have a black majority now all of this, to some extent, this ties into healthcare and it helps us to understand why Medicaid is not being expanded in Georgia because there are population politics. When you don't expand Medicaid, black women will die. The maternal mortality rate in Georgia is the highest in the nation. It's the highest in the nation. These are, we're talking population politics here and this is the same rhetoric that neo-Confederates were using in 1906 they're using the same rhetoric in 2022. Brian, he said it, Brian, y'all heard? He said, what, did he, what was the quote he, he had? Uh, he said, um, you see by, you see the, the Democrats going around here, they're registering all these um, minorities to vote and others who are sitting on the sidelines, meaning people are waiting to become citizens, immigrants, people of color are waiting to become citizens. Well, we need to do the same thing. That's the exact same message that Ben Tillman was given in 1906. We better wake up. We really need to, the national politics matter, but what is going on here in the South, in Georgia, in South Carolina, in Florida, it's neo-Confederate politics all over. You, Great replacement theory. Great, exactly. Yes. Exactly. This is, you're, you're listening to the great replacement theory being operationalized as political policy. Um, and it is, this is why we have to engage. Um, when we don't engage, this thing runs rampant, and it is our pushback on this. Um, politicians understand that there are consequences, and so there have to be consequences for advocating for the great replacement theory. You asked about federal, what will happen to Congress. I want to talk about the state, because we already know it, it did happen, and what happened was Republicans held serve. They held all those offices, which means that uh, there's not an attorney general um, who will uh, basically ignore challenge, legal challenges to the uh, abortion law. Uh, they'll, uh, we have Chris Carr who's promised to defend the anti-abortion law. You have a, a governor who says he wants to expand Medicaid. 
um, who, um, who is going to preserve uh, the gun expansions and other conservative measures and approaches that he advocated for. And I think most importantly, and, it, and it's hard to put this into words, but the state has a $6.6 .6 billion surplus. This is after the state's already paid all its bills. So the state has $6.6 .6 billion plus the rainy day fund in which to spend the money. And Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp had very different ways to spend that money. Stacey Abrams wanted to use it to expand Medicaid. She wanted to use it to give teachers pay raises, law enforcement officers pay raises, um, higher need scholarships, things like that. Governor Kemp has a very different view of this. He basically has outlined $2 billion in tax refunds and the rest of the $4 billion, we'll, we'll see. We, re we really don't know what he wants to do with that other money. Um, and, that's, and that's what the state of play here in Georgia is. Um, the state of Georgia's General Assembly remains in Republican control. Um, even had Stacey Abrams won, it would have been really hard for her to implement some of the changes. But as the governor, you get the final say on the budget, on legislation, on appointments, on judicial nominations, on all sorts of different things. The governor in Georgia has sweeping power. And so all these issues that we're talking about federally are as important as they are, as you mentioned, Ms. Professor, um, the state is where we see these, these, these really being played out at a, a level that they're going to affect us on a day-to-day -day level. On the federal level, playing cleanup behind the Trump administration, which has so many ethics violations, so many national security violations, um, I, you almost have to say this. It's almost like a mafia organization. How tight-knit and how loyal conservatives are. If you can't, if you had a fraction of that type of loyalty to progressive politics in this country, it would change the entire world. Not just this country, but the entire world. So I expect to see this red wave, it's not exactly a red wave, maybe a pink wave, maybe a red splash, whatever it is, it's gonna help to cover up, clean up the investigations um, into President, former President 45 to the Dome's um, administration, which has been basically a criminal organization. We have about 10 more minutes and we're gonna take questions from the audience. My last question for each of you, you know, I mentioned Janu January 6th. You know, after the presidential election, Donald Trump refused to accept the results. He filed dozens and dozens of lawsuits. And then months later, we saw the attack and destruction of the United States Capitol. This election, we saw most of the candidates concede. Um, so far, we have not seen the kind of reaction we saw in 2020. Is that a sign that our democracy is resilient or not? I think that what that is saying is a couple of things. One is that Donald Trump has been so focused in on all of the lawsuits and criminal charges coming against him and about Ron DeSantis's rise that he hasn't been able to like mobilize in terms of the big lie, the big lie, the big lie because he's now got a new enemy and that's Ron DeSantis. Yeah, yeah, De Ron DeSanctimonious uh, as, 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 as 45 would say. Um, and so I think that that's part of it. I think another part of it, we're not out of the woods. We are so not out of the woods. We had almost 300 election deniers uh, running for office across the United States in these key positions, Attorney General, Secretary of State, and Governor that dealt with who was going to, how the certification of the election in 2024 was going to happen. Um, most of them were, um, um, most of them lost, yes. Um, and it, particularly in the key swing states, most of them lost. But the fact that they're there and the fact that they had enough votes to get through the primary and onto the general election ballot begins to speak to the, the problems in the American system where you have what I think I saw something like 40% of, of Republicans don't believe that Biden won the 2020 election. 
I mean, that is, we, that's like the iceberg that's sitting there and we've got to figure out how to maneuver the Titanic around it. Because uh, it, it, they were trying to take us down in 2022 so that 2024 would not happen, um, that our votes would not count. And so it, it's like we got a little bit more playing time, but it means that we can't get complacent and think, whoo, dodge that one. Um, there is so much work to continue to be done to be ready for 2024, and we have to start now. And I've got to say, I'm, I'm, part of that is ensuring that Herschel Walker, Lord, um, is not in the U.S. Senate. Uh, it just, it, th this, because somebody as unqualified as that then sends the signal that you don't have to have any qualifications um, for a key uh, office. I mean, it's like, well, I slept at the Holiday Inn so I could be a U.S. Senator. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, and, and that is why we have to engage. Uh, this democracy is really worth it. Um, and there's so much that tells us that it's not until you're dealing with folks who haven't tasted democracy. Um, and, and, and they're hungering for it. And we don't wanna get to the point because once you lose it, trying to get it back is real hard, real hard. I'd say um, Trump kind of made it okay, and I'm saying this in quotes, okay, for, for many Republicans to, uh, uh, to election deny. To, to promote these false claims, and he's running again, and he's about to announce on Tuesday officially he's going to run for he's going to make his comeback bid. So you'll see a lot more division in the Republican Party over the future, and frankly, um, it'll inject itself into this race for U.S. Senate, and it's going to have all sorts of unforeseen um, effects. I don't know if it helps Senator Warnock or hurts him. Frankly, a lot of people think it helps Senator Warnock, but I don't. It might also energize the the MAGA base to go out there for Herschel Walker even more. That that we'll see. Um, but uh, I'd say overall, Georgia is the anomaly in that um, because of Trump's outlandish claims to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger demanding on that famous phone call that he find enough votes and, uh, and the Governor Kemp that he call a special session to reverse the election results and, and, and makes all these demands um, and their refusals of those demands made them look like um, you know, they were defenders of the democracy and, um, and their supporters you know, believe that way. And, and as we saw from uh, Bean Wynn, the Democratic candidate for Secretary of State, that you know, she said, Brad is not your friend just because he stood up to Donald Trump doesn't mean he's standing up for you as voters. And so you're seeing very different debates going out. Obviously, Brad Raffensperger won that election. But that election, had Brad Raffensperger lost to Jody Heiss, the election denier, um, who would have voted uh, not to confirm President Biden's election vis victory on January 6th, that, would have, that race would have been almost as important as the Senate and governor race nationally because it would have gotten almost as much attention. And so because Repu voters in the Republican primaries, with the help of a lot of crossover voters, we don't know how many, it's hard to completely tell, but with the help of tens of thousands of crossover Democratic voters, defeated Jody Heiss in the Secretary of State's race, defeated David, helped defeat David Perdue, although Governor Kemp did not need that help. He was already winning by such a big margin. And also defeated other trump back challengers for um, Attorney General and even Insurance Commissioner. Suddenly, a trump back challenger for Insurance Commissioner was cl claiming that the, uh, the Republican incumbent believed in woke insurance, whatever, whatever woke insurance means. I still don't <laughs> quite know what that means. Um, but Georgia became that sort of, you know, the, in the rest of the country, Arizona and other states, there are these election deniers who made it to the general election campaign, whereas in Georgia, um, they, the voters stopped them in the primaries. I would um, just answer briefly, is, is this democracy resilient? If, I would say yes if I see Donald Trump perp walk <laughs> from Mar-a-Lago and in, I mean, handcuffs. If I see that, then I'll be like, yeah, okay, we're, we're gonna be okay. Um, if not, the fact that we that Marjorie Taylor Greene and all these other folks that got reelected, you still have all these election deniers um, in in office. You, I mean, despite the fact that Roe versus Wade got uh, was was reversed, you still. I think that did help to, of course, blunt the wave. But is democracy resilient? This democracy, or this republic, and that's the other thing too. Democracy is an adjective. 
It's, it's, a, it's not really, we don't live in a democracy. We live in a Republican uh, republic. Um, and is this a democracy should be really the question. I don't know if it's resilient, but I think this republic is operating in the way that it in many ways was designed to, to keep white supremacy in place, to keep white men in place, in power, and they are not going any place unless you organize. So we're gonna have to, a couple of Hump Wednesdays, we're gonna have to transform those and make those political rallies. I don't know what artists y'all gonna have to find to do that. You, you might be out here, you, maybe you should be the one who's up on, I don't know, do y'all have a stage on Hump Wednesday? I don't know, I'm showing how out of, out of touch I am. Um, but I'll be quiet, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm professoring. <laughs> Well, thank you, panelists. We're gonna now open the uh, floor for questions. So if you have a question, please come up to the mic. Please make sure that you are asking a question and it's not a statement. And please make it brief. Well, okay, it's on now. Um, hey guys, I'm Jalen Brown, senior at Morehouse, and I'm also uh, an intern at CNN right now. Um, and so I have a question kind of talking about uh, what party is there for working class people? I was actually on Capitol Hill when I worked at Bloomberg when the um, Inflation Reduction Act was passed, and I actually was covering affordable childcare because like, um, it's really hard to afford a child right now uh, for working class women. Um, and it didn't go through with the act. Um, and people are kind of like wondering, okay, like what do we do w when it comes to like working class people? Like which party is actually there for them? Because it doesn't really seem like the Democratic Party is there. Um, Warnock actually doesn't agree with raising the minimum wage here from like 725. So like I'm kind of concerned like which party should like working class people like um, I guess um, vote for or should we do something more than vote um, for like a system that really doesn't seem like it's for working class people? That is a great question. And this is where issues of accountability are really important, where it's not just voting, but it is also then following up, it is tracking the legislation, it is calling in to your representatives, to your senators, making your position clear. Um, that kind of following up, that kind of accountability means so much because they're tracking what's happening. And it's knowing how, how did that get blocked? Who blocked it? Um, Manchin's name, feels, fingerprints feel like this all over that thing, right? Um, and so it's knowing the structure of how votes happen and the, it's knowing the structure of how votes happen and it's also knowing how you can inject yourself into that by holding your representatives accountable. What I will say is, I'm, I'm leery of third party politics because generally when I've seen third party politics, what happens is that the right wing gets in and they really don't give a rat's tail about the working class. And rat's tail is the scholarly term for that. <laughs> um, and you know, so I think of, of the, two, in the 2000 election, it was the Green Party or whatever it was um, that basically led to George W. Bush becoming president of the United States. And we saw how well that turned out for working class folk as we got into um, wars and as we also got into the um, mortgage crisis, the mortgage foreclosure crisis. So. Always, you should always be talking with your uh, colleagues, friends, comrades around the country about issues that are important to you. Um, I, I agree with Dr. Anderson about, about third party politics, but I'm, I vote Democrat, but I'm a Pan-African socialist. That's, that's my ideology, that's what I believe in, that's what I'm committed to. 
be clear on your values and w work with other people. But at some point in time, we just have to enter into coalition and realize sometimes we are basically voting to reduce the harm of an extreme neo-Confederate ideology that is in operation in this country. I forgot to mention, please direct your question to one panelist because we have a long line here. I want to make sure we get through everyone. But next, next question. Hi. Sorry. Hello. My name is Julian. I would like to say thank you all for coming here. It's really great. Um, my question is for Professor. Um, I'm wondering, what is your belief on healing our democracy? I may be young, but we have to understand that Trumpism, as well as neo-Confederate ideology injected into our democracy is creating cognitive dissonance in a lot of people's minds. And if we can't even agree who won an election, how are we going to be able to even continue on as a country? We have states who are willing to concede from the union, which makes absolutely no sense. And multiple uh, referendums have been held over the last few years on this point. So how do we heal? Um, how do we heal? is, it's going to sound repetitive, by engaging, by demanding truth, evidence, and facts, um, and holding folks accountable to truth, evidence, and facts, um, and, 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 and not holding up folks who are consistently denying truth, evidence, and facts. That means do not watch Fox, <laughs> um, right? Um, and, and, and that means that over time, because right now one of the things that's become clear in the evidence, in the research, is that those who are so far gone, when you provide them with the evidence, it just makes them dig down, double down even harder. But there's a large swath of folks who are persuadable, and that's where a lot of our work has to happen. Um, truth, evidence, and facts. Next question. Oh, Mike's not working again. Um, Repeat it. So I, I'm, I'm Coach Jordan, and I'm an engineer. Um, and I sat on Capitol Hill, and I interned on Capitol Hill this summer um, just being on the committee, and I was in all of the, um, the January 6th hearings. And so my question is, like, how, how do we um, ensure that it's not a trend that young black people are going out to vote? Because I believe after in recent elections um, that it's a trend right now to go out and vote, but how do we ensure that in 2024 it's not just a trend um, to go out and vote, and how can politicians ensure that it's not just a trend, um, and what can we do on our college campuses to make sure that you know, young people are still going out to vote, that, it's still, that it still matters, and that it's not just, oh, well, we made it past the Trump era, you know, um, it's okay now. It, it's not okay now. So uh, one of the things is that voting is a habit. Um, when you're used to voting, you're always used to voting, just as non-voting is a habit. Um, and so it's really important to be talking to your colleagues, your friends, your social groups that you're in, and, and talking about what's important to them, and then linking up what's important to this political process. So, you know, you want to have X, Y, Z. How does public policy affect that? You know, if you want affordable housing, then you need to have folks in power, in policy positions, who believe in affordable housing. You want affordable education and quality public schools. You need to have folks in power who believe in those things. And so it's having those conversations and then linking those conversations in with how are you registered to vote? This is how you register. Have you got your ballot yet? This is how you get your ballot, or this is where you go vote. This is how you check the My Voter SO, you know, My Voter page on the Secretary of State's website to ensure that you're continuing to be registered. Yeah. And really quickly, another question was for Professor, but there's no excuse not to know where candidates stand on the issue anymore. Uh, we at the AJC have banded together with Atlanta Civic Circle. We have a list of, I know it's a little late, but we have a list of policies, stances on every issue for every candidate, going from governor, senator, all the way down to Fulton County Commission and you know, your local state lawmakers. So, and you can find those resources wherever you vote. If, if you're voting in New Jersey or, or New Mexico, you'll find those local outlets with those issues. So you can find where they stand on health care, uh, education, um, abortion, all the major issues. No, it's not behind a paywall either. All right. 
we made sure of that. Good question. Uh, this is a question for, oh, my name is Omar Kaba. Uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Bluestein. I was just wondering, do you feel as though Democrats kind of shot themselves in the foot by, uh, if I'm correct, I don't know if I'm correct, but by financially supporting Republicans that they thought were too extreme? Because I know, I think there was a couple states where they were doing that, they were funding them, and then, uh-oh, they wound up winning. So I want to know if you think we really shot ourselves in the foot with that move. That didn't happen in Georgia, where, but you saw that in some other states, including, let's say, Pennsylvania, where Democrats uh, you know, supported the far-right gubernatorial candidate. I think they did support Mastriano, if I remember correctly. Mastriano ended up losing. Um, and many of those, uh, you know, I, I read a, I, I haven't seen a complete analysis, but I read a column yesterday basically saying that Democratic fears that those that would backfire didn't play out. Um, that most of those Democratic candidates ended up beating the far-right candidates that they supported. It is a very, very risky strategy um, that would make me nervous if I was in charge of it. But you did not see that in Georgia. You didn't see Democrats, let's say, support David Perdue or support the guy who called, talked about woke insurance or any of those things in hopes that they could, he would be more vulnerable in a November election. So I don't think it backfired on them in a major way, uh, but, but um, that's a great question. Um, hi, my name is Seth, and my question is for the professor. So um, my question is, obviously, you historically discussed how the Republican Party has very anti-BIPOC policies when it just comes to voting. So I'm, my question is, why are there candidates like Herschel Walker who are for you know, the Republican Party, despite clearly them not being for us? <laughs> um, one of the things that we have to remember is that there has always been some black folk who have aligned themselves with white supremacy because they have seen that that's where the, the gold is for them. And so they operate in a me kind of world vision instead of a we world vision. Um, and so there's always been a Herschel Walker um, swirling around white supremacy, trying to pick up the little chits that they can get from that. Um, yeah. <laughs> she could go on. Ooh, I really could. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Jackson, Chinese uh, major, political science, um, international studies minor from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And my question to you, uh, Mr. Bluestein, um, how do we uh, appeal to white women as voters? I saw a stat that was showing that a lot of white women went straight for the Republicans, even though we have situations like um, abortion, right? You should, yeah, I believe that should be one of the biggest issues towards women voters. How do, you, how do we Democrats appeal to those voters? That's a great question. And, and Biden, Ossoff, Warnock all had that sort of formula. And look, Trump helped, right? The Trump backlash, a lot of, uh, you saw a lot of, you know, the, the golden formula, white educated, college educated uh, white women um, who often in the suburbs. Um, ended up, uh, you know, some of them voted Republican, but a significant number of them voted for Democrats, and that helped, you know, uh, power that coalition. And many of those women, we don't have all the data yet. Uh, we have exit polls, but those are imperfect. Um, but many of those women look like they went back to the GOP. Uh, the gender gap was not nearly as big as Democrats expected it to be. The abortion issue, of course, was very, very, very important. Um, but to some of these, to some voters, and particularly some women voters, um, it, the economy was still the number one issue. Our polls showed that. Um, threats to democracy was also up there. Guns were also up there. But jobs and the economy were the number one. And, and this is more broader than just about women, but Governor Kemp's message, if you asked him about Trump, if you asked him about guns, if you asked him about whatever the, the, the issue of the day was, he would pivot back to the economy. And I have a story that was out a couple days ago about how he won. And, um, and his chief of staff said, if voters are telling you the economy is the most important issue, you'd be stupid not to listen. And so he was economy, economy, economy. And I don't know if that's the only, it, there's lots of different reasons out there, but the economic issue in this election, it might not be, it might be completely different in two years. You know, it could be, who knows what it'll be in two years. And two years ago, it was very different, right? Uh, but in this election with high inflation, that was the number one issue. And, and that was what Governor Kemp will say is the key to his, of him winning over white women. So 
But I have to say, um, in the 2018 gubernatorial election, over 70% of white women voted for Kemp. And then with the Dobbs decision and the six-week abortion ban, I saw the numbers that said 72% of white women voted for Kemp um, in, in this 2022 election. And so it tells you that there's something happening in there that isn't about the economy. To me, it is about um, the sense of, of white supremacy and the patriarchy that comes from there, that provides a level of comfort and security that Stacey Abrams really just cannot, when we're talking about crossing that, 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 that gender racial hill, that mountain, to me that's one of them right there. Um, the way that white women align with white supremacy and patriarchy. Really, everybody should, should be reading to understand why white women are putting race in front of um, uh, gender in, in terms of um, their electoral <coughs> decisions right now. Hi, my name is Justin Box. Uh, I'm a junior economics major. Uh, my question is concerning uh, the, the inroads that it seems like Republicans have made with black and Hispanic voters, particularly in Florida. Um, we saw Ron DeSantis beat Andrew Gillum by like less than half a percentage last time, but this time he won by, I think it was 20% or close to it. Um, do you think this is a larger trend that Democrats should be worried about um, in that picking up more black and Hispanic voters? Yes, that was, okay, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll go with it. And I, I think that is, I've, I haven't seen the numbers, y'all can tell me um, uh, what, what AP is, is saying in terms of analyzing the, the outcomes. But the Latino population in Florida increasingly is seeing um, much more of, you know, a place where they can express their their whole social values, political values, and I think that's making a, a big difference. In addition to some of the voter suppression, but I would defer. Yeah, I'm looking up the numbers right now. Okay. Um, but the fact I went back to it, the fact that Governor Kemp had consolidated Republican support early on, didn't have to worry about the MAGA base meant that he could spend more of his energy building out his own ground game. And he also, he didn't catch up to Stacey Abrams with fundraising. And that's another mountain, by the way. I wanted to mention that. Um, it's, it's not as a significant amount, but the fundraising mountain is a huge one. And it's why for a long time here in Georgia um, that even, even black Democratic leaders uh, wouldn't put forward or, or were really worried about a black Democratic candidate for governor because they believed that they couldn't raise the money. And Stacey Abrams did raise the money, and she set all sorts of records, and so did Senator Warnock. But um, she kind of broke the mold, and that was, um, and that was one of the reasons why. Uh, and I'm looking up these numbers really quickly, but the exit polls here in Georgia um, showed uh, a significant change. And here I am, sorry. Uh, in her rematch against Kemp, Stacey Abrams notched 46% of the vote. Um, she notched 25% from white voters. That's according to an NBC News exit poll. Traditionally, if a Democrat is going to win, they have to hit that 30% mark among white voters. 25% isn't going to do it. The same data showed that Kemp won the support of 43% of Latino voters and 46% of Asian American voters. Trump's, Trump had 37% of Latinos and a lesser percentage of, of Asian Americans. So Republicans are definitely making inroads with people with voters of color. And again, it's because you can do that as a Republican if you've blocked up your base of support, you can start expanding. Whereas in 2018, Governor Kemp didn't try to expand his base of support. He was trying to win the rural Georgia base. His stops were in Nahunta, Georgia, and, and, Camilla, and just you know traditionally rural areas where it would be a town of uh, 1,200 people and he'd get half the town to come up for him. And he'd try to improve on Donald Trump's margins in these counties. This cycle, he went to the suburbs, he went to Gwinnett County and would cater to Indian American voters. He would go to black town hall meetings. It's, you know, in, in part it's symbolic, right? But it also sent a message uh, to the media and to his supporters that he was trying to expand that base of support. How y'all doing? I'm Miles Johnson, senior communications major, uh, Jones and Meyer from Philadelphia. I'm also the uh, managing editor of the Maroon Tiger. This is for uh, Dr. Anderson. Uh, I feel like in this age, a lot of, um, young people, the way we obtain information is digitally. 
on like in terms of like news, like a lot of stuff is on like social media that like young people like um you know look at. So I guess uh what are some publications, uh and this for believe anyone too, uh publication that you all uh would uh uh that y'all would uh, say that you know gives good information, uh unbiased information on on politics and what's the import and describe the like the importance of obtaining like you know, real information, you know, reading articles instead of like just, you know, seeing something off social media, off, off Instagram or something like that. Thank you. So I used to um, really rely on Twitter. <laughs> what Elon Musk is doing with it now, Lord have mercy. Um, but there were just, there were so many sites to pull from from there. You had really smart people who were, were linking articles from different publications. And one of the things is that we have to learn how to be able to look at a array of articles critically to see, to assess their biases, um, to see how they're weighing evidence, to see whether they're being critical or whether, you know, so it was like this last piece, that last wave where they were all talking about this big red wave, the big red wave, because they were all pulling on these Republican skewed polls that looked like there was this big red wave and then it was like, oops, uh, mm. um, and so it is, it is reading a number of things. So I do the New York Times, the Washington Post, LA Times, Philly Inquirer, the AJC is fabulous. It is fabulous. The work the AJC does is top notch. I include the AJC's work in my research um, because it is so good. Um, the, so I look at a lot, you know, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I look at a lot of local newspapers um, as well as the big national ones because that's where I get a lot of the great information. Can I just add real quick, you also have this really unique opportunity to be there and see these candidates in real life. Um, Raphael Warnock, Senator Warnock's first runoff event was at the John Lewis mural yesterday. Um, and even you can also see candidates you might not like. Herschel Walker has events all the time too. Uh, it, it is very valuable to see not just the rhetoric and the messaging uh, beyond the commercials and beyond all that crap, which we are all tired of, um, of the candidates that you favor, but also hear what's coming out of the mouths of the candidates you're not a, a fan of, maybe, um, just to see the, the different messaging that's influenced the electorate. And you have that opportunity, not just in this runoff, because it's over soon, thank God, <laughs> but think about 2024. Candidates are going to be coming here. They're going to be coming to the AUC campus, but they're also going to be coming to Metro Atlanta in a way that they didn't in past elections. So I encourage you to go see them for yourself and not rely. I want you to read the AJC and the New York Times and all that, but see them with your own eyes so you can see what messaging they're putting out. Uh, <coughs> Hello, my name is Mercury Hall. I am a uh, senior sociology major from Delaware Valley, Texas, and I actually want to go back to this idea of looking at the rhetoric of uh, politicians. As a sociologist, I focus on controlling images and media, and with the mentions in this panel of neo-confederate, alt-right, white supremacist talking points actually driving politics um, in media, in your about 20 years of experience, um, what have you found are the best ways to combat these talking points and lessen their impact? That's a great question. Um, and we, we had to deal with it a lot with Donald Trump because at first you saw an aversion from the media to call a lie a lie. And frankly, for me, I remember when the New York Times did it. And I was like, okay, that's a signal to all of us, right? I mean, the, we, the New York Times does it. Um, and we started calling lies lies, I think, more. And we still have to go through certain editing processes to do that. But we use tr something, sometimes we just ignore it. You know. It, 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 you go to a rally and 16 false things are said, you don't necessarily have to go cover all those false things. Sometimes you do, sometimes you go in there with the intent of, of reporting on, the, on all that, but other times you're there to not necessarily cover all that and to amplify those lies. And you have to be very careful on social media. It's a very, we, we in the media world haven't figured this out yet because we don't know how to combat false lies because even 
false lies, lies, <laughs> false lies. Because even if, let's say when Donald Trump is tweeting, even if I would quote tweet it with my however many followers I have on Twitter uh, to his tens of millions and say this is wrong because, he used to always say, for instance, it always annoyed me, that Michelle Obama endorsed um, uh, Stacey Abrams and that was the, re it was just, it just, it was Barack Obama. And I don't know, it was just a little thing, but I'd amplify it and say, actually, you know, this or that happened. It didn't, all it did was amplify the underlying lie, right? And that's a minor example, but if you're, if, if he's lying about the election results and I'm out there saying, actually, the election results, blah, 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 and I'm amplifying his tweet, it's a problem. So instead, we've gone to something called the, tweet, the truth sandwich, which is the trend in journalism, which is truth. The election results in Georgia were, were not false, and they were con con confirmed by federal judges and even Trump's own attorney general, yada, yada, yada. Trump saying it's not the truth again. I don't know if that's the best way to, to combat it, but that's the way that we in the media industry have come up with right now. And in two years, it might be something completely different. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Ellibert. I'm a senior computer science major here at Morehouse College. My question is for all the panelists, but of course, I want to hear what uh, Dr. Livingston has to say. So I wanted to stick on the topic of black fear. Um, my question is, as my question is, um, when you see uh, political figures such as Barack Obama shown in negative light in America, um, how can we, I guess, what advice do you have for our generation, millennials and Gen Zers, for overcoming barriers? Because if that's the negative light that they have on those political figures, I mean, we could imagine, you know, how they view ordinary citizens. So what, uh, what advice do you have to overcoming these barriers in gender or racial uh, uh, tensions that we see in uh, conservative states and with neo-Confederate uh, conservative environment that we're seeing in our generation, what advice do you have for us overcoming these obstacles? Because uh, I guess mostly, mostly what, oh, let me get my thoughts together. You're putting a lot on the table. Can I, can, can I address the first part just about how do we address fear? Well, and confronting these ideologies. Can I'm I? almost finished. I'm almost finished. Oh, okay. um, so, would you say that the only thing we could really do is focus on the uh, federal government putting certain political figures in place to address these certain topics that we're having, uh, because we're seeing a very negative climate nowadays. So, what advice or do you have for our generation to overcome these obstacles? Uh, would it just be trying to put certain f federal government officials in place, or is there something that we could do more on a grassroots level? Like, yeah. what what do you uh, recommend? From the inside out, you have to grow the dog that's in the fight. You have from the inside out. You have to have a relationship with your ancestors. You need to do research on what they did to stay in the fight, to stay in the game. And some of it might not be the most um, uh, scholarly things. You know, when I started my career as a professor, um, it was in 1996, I took my first job at San Diego State University. We had a professor, two professors who were shot and killed like the month before I came to the job. And then there was this threat against all black faculty members. We're gonna kill at least one black faculty member in San Diego. And San Diego is like, that's, Escondido is like the skinhead capital. So everybody knew where it was coming from. We, you know, we had a choice. But what, what, how do we, what do we do? We, we turn to each other and we're like, okay, yeah, now we gotta keep doing what the hell we gotta do. You just gotta check your car when you go, when you buy, <laughs> you check your tailpipe or whatever, make sure there's nothing under your car make sure no one has opened your engine or whatever. But to me, it's always been about knowing my family history, knowing the fact 
that my great, great, great grandfather voted at a time when it was very extreme, you know, extremely difficult for black folks in 1880, Fortune Edwards, I gotta say his name, he voted in South Carolina, in Georgetown, South Carolina. And most black folks, black men, of course, black women could, could not vote at the time. So grow, the, grow that, that fight from within. That cultural autobiography that you wrote in, in the intro to Africana Studies, rewrite it, go back, add more, do more research, find more information. You have to have a personal relationship with this history. It is not just academic. And everything else kind of falls in along, along with that. Sorry, that's a very general answer. Charles, we have five more minutes, two more questions. Thank you. Uh, Cruz Duhart, senior English major. Uh, my question would be, how do we trace the impact that some of these voting policies have had on us? Whether that's finding out you know, how much voter suppression has, ha has happened, what would be the number and the difference of voters, things like that. Okay, so I wrote a book. <laughs> it's called One Person, No Vote. And first, that first chapter, I walk us through the history of disfranchisement, how you had folks hollering voter fraud, voter fraud, and we have to have election integrity as a means then to end corruption at the ballot box, which was the massive disfranchisement of black folk. And I walk us through that. And then after that history, I start walking us through the current methods of voter suppression with key data about, you know, so this is how this policy emerged, this is how it looks race neutral while it's racially targeted, and this is what those targets look like. And so that, look at that book um, and look at the footnotes um, because then that gives you the sources where that information comes from and so for instance, in Wisconsin, because this isn't just a Southern thing, um, this thing is nationwide. In Wisconsin, um, after the Republicans implemented voter ID um, and, and Scott Walker moved the departments of motor vehicles um, to the outskirts of Milwaukee and off of public transportation routes, and, and Milwaukee has something like 70% of the state's black population what they uncovered in the 2016 election was that 8% of whites were not able to vote because they didn't have an ID. 27% of black voters were not able to vote because they didn't have an ID. And the, the drop off from the 2012 election to the 2016 election, there was a 60,000 drop in the number of votes cast in Wisconsin. And 68% of that drop came right out of Milwaukee. Yeah, so the data are there. Um, one person, no vote. Um, I lay it out, Ari Berman's, give us the ballot, lays it out. Um, rat, I can't say that rest of the word, but that's a, a, a term used by the Republicans as they were figuring out how to gerrymander the maps by David Daly is excellent, excellent. So the works are out there to see how this thing works and, and it helps us figure out how do we intervene, yeah. Hi, I'm Antonio Sweeney, a freshman business administration with a concentration in marketing, minoring in political science from Flint, Michigan. And my question to you all is, we are seeing a wave of young people getting involved in voting, but how do we hold candidates on both sides of the aisle, whether it's left or right, accountable after the election, win or lose, because position doesn't always mean power? How do we hold them accountable once they're in office? is that you are contacting their office regularly. Um, you know, seeing where they are on the positions. You know, there are laws that are, are bills that are being discussed. There are policies that are being discussed. And you are weighing in, making it really clear where you stand. Their legislative staffs are making sure, are, are writing this down so that their, um, that they know what's going on with their constituency because they're gonna get a sense that this is an engaged constituency. So if I come out here acting a fool, 
then I'm going to pay for it in the next election because they're going to know I acted a fool and I went against what they wanted. And I would just add the Capitol is less than two miles from here. It's open to the public. I'm serious. When there's a big vote, go. The, the lawmakers are human. They're human. This isn't federal, you know, this isn't Congress where it's really hard to, they're walking in and out. They, you're their constituents, right? They, they will listen to you. That might not change their minds, but they will. You will show them if you're passionate about a certain issue that's coming up for a vote. Show up if you can. If you can't, support other people who are showing up. You can actually personally contact these lawmakers. They're not in some high and mighty ivory tower or something. But they're they're right there for you. So when you don't do it alone, join. Um, actually, if you, there's not an organization in terms of what you believe in, you form an organization. Two or three people getting together writing letters, thinking through these ideas, and working together. I mean, organizing is absolutely necessary. Yes. So, you know, don't try to do it alone. Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> this has been a very engaging conversation um, and very inspired by the students and their questions. I'm really hopeful for the future, seeing you all ask really thoughtful, intelligent, substantive questions. So a round of applause for you all as well. Now we're gonna bring back Mr. Thomas. Again, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank the tremendous contributions that you've made uh, to our knowledge about, about the politics and, and both of what just happened and what we can expect to happen in the future. And um, I, uh, I, j I just want to, again, reiterate what they've said about um, being engaged and also taking, taking advantage of opportunities. Um, my students who are here um, have heard this a million times, but I'm still going to re repeat it which is I have a personal model, which is just show up. Because um, you get all of these opportunities and great speakers and thinkers coming to the college and um, that will not happen once you become adult. You're gonna have to drive from your suburban house downtown and make an extra, extra effort to, to meet those people and often you're gonna have to pay for it. But here at college, I guess you've already paid for it with your tuition, <laughs> and this is part of what you get. And so it's really important to take advantage of these opportunities. And I just want to mention also that um, a cu couple students here mentioned some of the opportunities they've gotten out of the journalism program. Um, Jalen Brown talked about the fact that he spent the summer in DC. He was an intern with the Bloomberg Industry Group as a, as a business writer. And um, so that helped him get a job now as uh, a writer for CNN while he's still in school. And then um, Miles Johnson here in the, in the gray suit, and actually we did not buy them at the same time. <laughs> but um, Miles last year, I, I formerly was a sports writer for 30 years, I used to cover the NBA. And um, so I was able to take Miles and two other students to the NBA All-Star Weekend, and they covered the whole weekend. They got to interview the players, they got to cover the games, um, they got to learn how to write on deadline with me looking over their shoulder at their stories and editing them. And it, it's, you know, it's just an ex a tremendous experience and we were the only HBCU um, with, uh, with college students there covering the whole um, All-Star Weekend. So and that was another one and a third student was here, Colby Scales, and you remember he mentioned that he was an intern with Homeland Security and actually got to um, sit in on all these January 6th congressional hearings. So those are incredible experiences and I will just tell you one of the reasons I am so interested in politics and my intro class I'm very proud of because a lot of them came to the class with very little interest in politics whatsoever. And they've covered debates, they've been to podcasts and they've been here and they, they've really grown. But my political growth came both from growing up in the, in the 50s and 60s and um, seeing all of the things that we know about 
uh, that black people had to go through during the civil rights era. But also, I was a political science major. And my first semester, my senior year, I got to spend it as an intern for um, Detroit Congressman John Conyers. And that experience of working on Capitol Hill, and also Conyers was one of the first advocates for Martin Luther King um, birthday being, uh, becoming a national holiday. Um, just being involved in that um, ignited an interest in politics that, uh, that, uh, that would not have happened if, uh, if I hadn't had that hands-on day-to-day experience. So take advantage of all these opportunities that come to you. Um, people love to help college students. It makes everybody, makes them, the people who help you, it makes them feel good. And they know that as a college student, you're uh, serious about developing your education and a profession. But once you get out in the world, um, you got to do that yourself a lot. Do you mind if I Go right ahead. do a shameless plug? Um, <clears throat> we have a class. First of all, please take Africana Studies, history, English, religion, philosophy, philosophy classes. In Africana Studies, we have a class called Black Liberation Movements, which compares like civil rights movement with the Haitian Revolution and movements for democracy in other parts of the world. Take classes like that, and because you'll get a chance to really see um, how like Black Lives Matter, how the similarities and differences. Um, but I got to put a shameless plug in for that class, Black Liberation Movements. Um, we have our, that Gullah Geechee class. You'd be surprised how much you learn about the Black Freedom Movement from studying about rural Black folk. And please think about taking those classes as well. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. I just want you to know I play tennis with Sam, and he, in between sets, he squeezes in <laughs> the Black Liberation Movement. <laughs> so he's he's always thinking about that. So um, I've got the uh, the tickets here for um, for the uh, the ticket stubs, and I've got the tickets here for Wakanda Forever. And these tickets are. Um, these are for next Friday, and they're at the uh, AMC Madison Yards uh, th Theater, which is only about like a 10-minute drive from here. So let me go. Let me call out the stub numbers. Let's, let's see who's still here. Um, I'll just call out the last three numbers, because it looks like the first four are all the same. 711, anyone got that? Seven one one. No, okay. Well, come on down. Come on down. <laughs> Price is <Don't> right. <laughs> the last three numbers. The last three numbers. Okay, six six eight zero. Come on down. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Shake it up more. Shake it up more. Okay, we'll do that. Who is? <laughs> Hold on. Is it more than one? No, I said six zero eight. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I thought you said six eight. I don't know. <laughs> All right, six one three. No, no. Six one three going twice. Six zero seven. No. Okay. Six six nine. Six zero one. A lot of people have left. Six zero one.
Five four four. Five four four. Nope. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I got. <laughs> Five six three. Okay. You don't want that. <laughs> What number are you? What number were you? Okay, good. 701. Nope, 701. Nope. 572. Okay. 568. Boy. That shows how big a crowd we had, huh? 539. Five two four. Five two four? Huh? Oh no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> Five one three. Boy. Six seven zero. Still no. Six seven five. <sighs> What'd you say? Five eight one. Five eight one? No. Five eight three. All right. Five four one. Six four six. Six six seven. Mm-hmm. Nope. <laughs> five five three. Oh, you didn't have a ticket. <laughs> five, five, three. Huh? A fours? Okay, I got it. Okay, okay. Okay. Four, four six, five. What? What? <laughs> Did he really? Oh, wait, he... Were you, Huh? No. No. <laughs> okay. Let's see. I'll try to find some fours in here. All right. Man. Okay. I'm just going to take them as they come. Four, six, five. Nope. Five seven seven. All right. <clears throat> okay, five six one.
Six one six seven zero nine. Oh, you got it. Okay. See, it's a bonus of taking my class. So, okay, uh, five three zero. Oh. Nope. Okay. Uh, six one two. Oh, six seven six. I do. Okay. Six two four. Oh, man. Okay. Five eighty six. Five eight six. Five five four. Which are you? Got about five left. Okay. Five oh three. No one. Okay. Seven one two. Five one seven. This one? Okay. Five eight five. Six three four. Six oh nine. Not many fours in here. <laughs> four nine one. Four nine one. No. Five oh eight. Five nine eight. Boy, it's a good thing I didn't get twenty five of these, huh? Five four zero. Six four one. Six one zero. Six one zero. All right. <clears throat> Okay, four eight three. Five five seven. Five six four. No way. Five No one. Okay, and down to the last one here. This is the last one? Mm hmm. Four, six, zero. Oh my God, I'm going to close. Four, six, zero? No, no, no. Okay.
Okay, this is a winner. Four eight zero. I can feel it. There you go. <laughs> One second. Just one second. You're welcome. One second. One second. Hold up. Hold up, folks. Peace. So we also have some gifts for our, for our family.